Hi. About 10 years ago, I built this little demonstration layout for a train show we were attending. And uh, it has a couple of interesting characteristics. First of all, it's on a Lazy Susan, if you will, some uh, rollers so that it will spin. But more importantly, <coughs> excuse me, if I connect a couple of wires correctly, <laughs> you'll see it start to go up in the air. It will tilt more and more like this, and I think you can imagine Now you may have noticed right there needs a little bit of a, there we go, a little bit of a push. It stopped going up automatically. That brings us to the topic of this video, which is limit switches. This particular layout has two limit switches underneath. One limits how far it goes this way, and the other how far it goes this way. Let me speed this train up a little bit. Come on. There it goes. And if I bring it back down again to its other limit and slow the train down while I'm doing that. And again, I'm not touching anything. It stops at the lower limit. If I reverse the polarity to that motor, it goes back up again. And if I speed the locomotive up at the same time, Let's see if we have any luck here getting it to go on its own. Oh, I think it's going to jump the track down here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the problem with running something at speed like that. If you get it just right, it runs perfectly. If you don't have it right, you've got all kind of problems. Let me speed it back up again. See if we can get it to pick up at that angle. And I think that angle is the maximum. There it goes. As it climbs up the hill, Oh, it's going to start all by itself, spinning its wheels. And I think that's pretty close to the maximum speed on the locomotive. Okay, let's stop that. And move ahead to the real topic of this video. Uh, limit switches as they apply to an animation on a little trolley that I've been working on for a couple of weeks. This trolley uh, was scratch built for the children's library in our local community. And it's got a conductor on the front and a conductor on the back. And the way it's set up right now, they're both facing, well, what would be forward if they're going in that particular direction. And when the train runs, it's going to be on a point-to-point, -point, oh, 50 to 100 feet long. At the end of that point-to-point, -point, it's going to reverse. And I thought it'd be kind of nice, instead of having one of the guys always facing backwards, how about if we could set them up so that it would automatically have both of them now are facing this way and at the far end when it reverses have this one automatically turn around and this one automatically turn around and again that brings us to the topic of the video which is limit switches there are actually four limit switches underneath this trolley along with a, a two geared motors that help to have that uh, animation happen and we're going to take a closer look at how that works in just a minute Okay, let's take a little bit closer look at what happens with the conductors. If I apply power in one direction, now we've got the trolley going this way, you can see that they're both facing forward. Let's see if I get a little more light on there. If I reverse the power, they turn around, they're both facing this way. Again, at the end of the point to point, power would reverse. When it starts up, they'll both turn and be going in that direction. Let's take a look underneath and see if we can determine exactly how this is operating uh, with the motors and the, uh, the limit switches. The first decision I had to make when I was designing uh, the animation for this trolley was what type of motor uh, should I use? Uh, I had a couple of options. I'd, I'd use servos for many different things. Now, servo is a, a great way to have that rotate because I could simply attach the, uh, the conductor to the top of that. The problem with servos, two things. 
first of all, it needs some sort of electronic circuit to make it operate. So it really needs either a microcontroller or some sort of device to tell it where to turn and when to turn. And I wanted to keep this as simple as I could make it. The other problem is this is a very large servo, and to get that underneath the trolley would be pretty tough. Now, there are smaller servos. Here's a what's called a 9-gram servo that certainly would have fit underneath. Two problems with this. Again, it needs an electronic circuit to operate. The main problem is these small, inexpensive servos are typically made with plastic or nylon gears that really don't hold up all that well, and I wanted something that was pretty robust that would last a long time. What I settled on was a geared DC motor. Uh, here's the motor right down here and the gear train up at the top delivers a tremendous amount of current or excuse me, a tremendous amount of torque and I can demonstrate when I connect this up to a battery I've got an arm on there so you can see it rotate turn it the other way and you can buy these uh, they're available on Amazon, uh, Banggood, eBay and so on you can get them with different uh, gear ratios and different voltages this one happens to be running on 3.7 volts. It's probably a little fast for what we're doing. The one I settled on using is a little bit higher uh, gear ratio that goes a bit sl more slowly. So you've got a motor. That can be put underneath. I had to add an arm to it. That's what you see sticking out here because you need something that's going to hit the switch. Now speaking of switches, I had to choose micro switches also to act as my limit switch. This is a fairly large one, but it's got the characteristics of most, most micro switches. It's got an arm, and you can probably hear it clicking on and off. And it has three contacts. There's a common one down here, a normally open and a normally closed contact. Now, what does that mean? Well, the normally closed contact allows uh, power to travel from the common through the normally closed when the switch is open. When you close the switch, the normally open contact conducts electricity through the common and the normally closed is disconnected. What we're interested in is the normally closed contact that will allow the motor to run until this gets hit. So we need two limit switches and I've got a mock-up that I used in my testing. You can see here I have the motor mounted vertically and you can see the shaft. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but it comes through the top. I've got a switch here. You can hear it click. And a switch over here. And here's the arm that goes in between. And I've got a double pull, double throw switch that I can use to turn the power one way or the other. And if you watch, when it hits the switch, it goes off. And the power is disconnected. But here's the question. Right now, the power is off. It's been disconnected. When I turn the power, the, the double pull, double throw switch to reverse the polarity of the power, what turns it back on? Well, the secret there is something called a diode. A diode is a very simple semiconductor. I've got one in my fingers here. A diode will only allow current to travel in one direction. So the diode is wired across the normally open, or excuse me, the normally closed contacts so that when the electricity is traveling in one direction it shuts it off but as soon as I reverse the direction of the the power the polarity that diode conducts and just for an instant it supplies power to the motor until the switch is released and it will allow it to go to the other extreme so I'm all I'm doing here is flicking a double pull double throw switch to uh, have the polarity changed and it draws very little power. It's drawing power when it rotates, but as soon as it hits the limit switch, the amount of power it draws drops to just about zero, if not completely uh, to zero, maybe a little bit through the, uh, through the diode. Now let's talk a little bit about how we're going to connect our conductor. This is actually a little sample guy that I had uh, to that motor. I used, first of all, a little device called a Dubro collar. These little brass collars have a set screw installed on them so that you can take a, uh, let me get one of them out of the package here, doesn't want to come through. It's a little, it's actually a chrome plated brass collar that fits over there and there's a set screw that you can uh, put into a hole in the side and lock it onto there and all I did after that 
was to take a magnet. Here's a group of a hundred small uh, neodymium magnets that I got from Amazon. Uh, glue the magnet on top, glue a matching magnet onto the conductor, in this case the engineer. Got that backwards. And that holds, if it's glued, it holds real well. The advantage of using a magnet is I can take the conductor right off just by tipping him and pulling and putting him back on is real simple. I can also rotate him if I want to have him start facing uh, in the opposite direction. So we have a collar that goes on the motor, a magnet on the collar, and a magnet on the conductor, or in this case, uh, the engineer. That pretty much takes care of it, and what you see underneath is the exact same thing I had on the, de uh, the demonstration. Here's the motor, the gear uh, train, and I've got two limit switches, one here and one over here. When it turns in one direction, it'll hit one switch, stop. Goes, when the polarity changes on the motor, it goes the other way and stops. There are two identical circuits, one at each end. I tried to get away with only having one set of limit switches, but what happened is the motors kind of got out of sync and it just didn't work out well. But those are the only parts that you need. A simple motor, the little collar to go on top of it, a couple of magnets, a couple of limit switches, a couple of diodes, and you've got a rotating conductor animation.